Hi everyone, Brian from Sui Generous Brewing here, and it is Friday, November 15th, 2024. It's been a while since the last video, but it's finally time for a quick update at least on the 50 meter beer project. For anyone who's new to my channel or who maybe hasn't heard about this project before, this is my attempt to produce a beer entirely from ingredients uh, prepared from within 50 meters of my home. Uh, so to do that, I have grown and harvested some bare barley. This is a variety of barley that uh, dates back about 1,200 years to the Viking era uh, that I've been growing now for two years. And actually in the last video, that's basically where we were. The hops were getting close to but weren't quite ready for harvesting. I didn't have any yeast yet. I actually didn't even really have a plan for malting or brewing yet. Uh, so this update has to do with some of the things that have happened since then. So first up, where are we with the barley? So in the last video, I had just finished harvesting and winnowing the grain, uh, and it's basically been sitting in my basement ever since. Now, that's not just laziness on my part, it's partially laziness on my part, but this is a very old variety of barley, and it still has a property called dormancy. And so what dormancy is, is a delay from when the grain ripens on the stalk to when the grain will then uh, be able to sprout. And in nature, that's really important because you don't want the grain to fall off the stalk, have a warm fall day, and have it start sprouting. You want it to overwinter and sprout again in the spring. So dormancy is typically about a three-month period, uh, wherein that barley will not sprout or grow. And well, it's almost been a month now since my last uh, germination test, but last time I did this, it was at about 80% germination. So we're pretty close, and I bet you at this point uh, it's ready to malt. Uh, I've just started this morning a germination test, so we'll see in about five days uh, whether we actually are at that 95% or better germination rate that you want before you malt. Now that said, even if it's ready to malt, uh, now it's going to have to wait a few more weeks. Uh, I am have to travel a little bit for work and can't really malt grain remotely. So I'm going to have to wait till I get back before I start that. The other big piece of the picture at this point are the hops. Uh, so I'm growing an old variety of hops called Canadian red vines. Uh, these are a pretty uh, fun hop. Uh, they're incredibly productive plants uh, and the hops that they produce have kind of a combination of sort of your classic piney resiny character and cherries. Uh, and actually they work really well in pale ales and beers like that. That cherry flavor is really nice. Uh, so this year I have three plants. One of them is a two-year-old plant. The other two are one-year-old plants, and uh, they produced an insane amount of hops. Uh, in fact, I only picked about half of them, and I ended up with <laughs> probably a three-year supply from that. Uh, and so with those hops, I did two things. Uh, the first thing that I did is I brewed a fresh hop ale uh, using hops. I literally picked them off the plants and threw them with into the brew kettle within 15 minutes of them being picked. Uh, that pale ale was delicious. It lasted about two and a half weeks before the keg kicked, um, but it really was a, a wonderful beer. And if you haven't brewed with fresh hops before, uh, it is a little challenging. They're pretty bulky. They hold on to a lot of liquid. Um, so basically I, I brewed an extra five liters and still ended up a liter short because of the amount that was absorbed by the hops. Uh, but there is one nice thing about brewing with fresh hops and that's that they basically act as a giant filter. So I've never had wort as clear as the wort that came out of uh, my brew kettle that day. And it's just because all of the trub that would normally come through into the fermenter was trapped up in those hops. Uh, but like I said, the beer was fantastic. I enjoyed every second of it. Uh, and I just wish I had made a double batch because it really did not last very long. The rest of the hops I dried in a food dehydrator at about 40 degrees Celsius, which I found somewhere was sort of an ideal temperature for drying hops to get um, sort of the best uh, aroma and flavor character out of them without really damaging them. Uh, so we'll see. I haven't brewed with the dried hops yet, so we'll see how that panned out. Uh, in previous years, I've just dried them under cold air uh, through a screen. But again, uh, the source that I read claimed that higher temperatures are actually better uh, for developing and locking in some of those flavors and aromas. 
still outstanding is the yeast. Uh, a few months ago, actually closer probably to a year ago, uh, one of my, my viewers from out on the West Coast uh, was kind enough to send me some uh, cold tolerant yeast. And actually I'm supposed to do a genetic ID on that for them. I apologize if you're watching this video, I swear I'm on to it now. Uh, but I'm obviously not going to use that yeast in this project because that kind of defeats the 50 meter point. I mean, that's more like a 5,000 kilometer beer project instead of a 50 meter beer project. Uh, but that uh, donation of yeast motivated me to try and find similar cold tolerant yeast uh, around here. So there's been uh, a fair amount of success lately among yeast researchers at identifying Saccharomyces uberianus and Saccharomyces berryanus, uh, which are two of the cold tolerant yeast species out there. And in fact, uh, Saccharomyces uberianus, when it crossed with conventional brewer's yeast is what gave us lager yeast. So, you know, given that some other amateurs have been successful at isolating these as well, I thought I'd give it a try. The way you do this is actually pretty simple. Uh, I didn't shoot video of this because I wasn't thinking about it at the time, but basically you just take a sterile Q-tip and you swab the bark of trees and then you, you cut that Q-tip off into wort uh, and you grow that wort like a starter. It's just, you do it in a fridge. So I have uh, just through the wall there, not that you can see it, uh, a dedicated fridge that we use for making cheese. So it sits at about 13 Celsius at all times. And so basically I put my yeast starters in there uh, and most of them developed uh, some yeast growth, so we were able to find some cold tolerant yeast. Most of them did not taste very good, but I do have one strain uh, that I'm growing up now into a larger quantity to at least do a small scale test before I dedicate my uh, precious homegrown grain and hops to a brew day, uh, but it seems promising. It's a little tiny bit phenolic. It is a wild yeast. That's not a big surprise, uh, but unlike the other ones, it's not throwing these horrible, um, almost soapy, I'm not sure if they're esters or aldehydes or what, but uh, a lot of the other yeast produced flavors that I, I, you know, were like potpourri and soap. It was really unpleasant. So this one I'm hoping will work out. Assuming that yeast is good, I actually have a plan for brewing. And the plan for brewing, and, and I should say a plan for malting as well, is I want to try and create something similar to what some of the earliest lagers or at least earliest cold fermented beers may have been like. So I want to take my uh, grain and I want to make two different malts from it. Uh, the first malt that I want to make is something akin to a Pilsner malt. Uh, so for, the, for those of you familiar with malting, you know how that's made. But if you don't, uh, making Pilsner malts is actually fairly simple. It's probably one of the simplest malts to make. Uh, you hydrate the grain to a relatively low hydration, so it's fairly quick to hydrate the, the grain, and you then let the grain sprout, and then you dry it and very gently kill it. So it's a relatively simple uh, malting process. But I also want to have a little bit more character in this beer than just sort of a straight Pilsner malt. And so to do that, what I want to do is make something closer to, say, a Cara Munich malt. And the way these malts are made is a little bit different. Actually, it's not a little bit different. It's quite a bit different from how you would make something like a Pilsner malt. Uh, for those kinds of malts, you want to hydrate the malt to a much higher hydration level, typically over about 42 to 46%. You then germinate it like you would uh, any other malt. But once the germination is done, instead of drying it out and then killing it for color and flavor, you instead basically seal it in a bag so its moisture is retained and you heat it up to mash temperatures and what that will do is allow those enzymes you just developed in the malt to basically convert the starches into sugar so you're essentially mashing the malt inside of the kernel then what you do for something like a, a munich malt or one of the kara malts is you increase the temperature to a range where you'll get a lot of Maillard reactions happening. So this is where sugars basically react with proteins to form flavors of stone fruits and toastiness and all those wonderful things we get from caramalts. And then you finally finish by sort of drying it out and roasting it in the oven to caramelize the remaining sugars. And it's actually a very similar process to making caramel malts, except with the caramel malts, you skip that middle Maillard step. You just go straight from your wet malt to your, your kilning to create that crystallized sugar. 
But I'm hoping in doing that, I can develop a lot more malt flavor and malt character, which, especially if the yeast are maybe a little questionable, might, uh, might make the beer a little bit more friendly to drink. And of course, that'll be hopped with the red vines that I currently have packed away in the freezer, and we'll be brewing with water from the well down the hill. Uh, so assuming all of those parts come together, I should have uh, probably early in January 2025, a rustic uh, lager brewed with a wild lager yeast, so to speak, uh, again, made from malts and hops uh, produced right here on my property. So the next video will probably follow sometime in mid-December when I start or finish that malting process. Uh, another thing I'm excited about this year is I'm going to try to floor malt instead of malting in a bucket. Uh, I'm not sure it'll be hugely different for my procedures, but, you know, I've got to try new things to keep things interesting. Anyways, that's the update. Uh, hopefully you found it interesting, and I hope I'll see you in a couple of weeks or a month when the next video comes up.